Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a tidbit about the phrase quick and dirty, a quick and dirty tip about the word momentarily, and a meaty middle about writing clear sentences. But first, I have a webinar coming up that you might want to attend or even watch with your whole team. I'm working with Reagan.com to do an advanced AP-style training session with a live Q&A at the end. I'll cover tricky apostrophe rules, advanced comma rules, new additions to the AP style book, and common questions. The webinar is on Thursday, September 13th from 1 to 2.30 Central Time, and it'll also be recorded so you can watch it later if you can't make that date and time. To learn more and sign up, go to bit.ly slash grammar webinar. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash grammar webinar. Next, Yael, who left a very nice review on Apple Podcasts, asked a question I get asked a lot. Quote, I get that these tips are quick, but how are they dirty? Has that been explained in a past episode? I've been listening for the past year and have never had that question answered. Unquote. Thanks, Yael. I've explained it in interviews, but I don't think I've ever explained it in the podcast. Here's the story. When I was growing up, my mom would always use the phrase quick and dirty for something that was just the essentials. For example, she might say, man, let's do a quick and dirty job on these dishes before we watch TV. And we'd get things loaded in the dishwasher and probably get an especially dirty pan soaking in the sink, but we wouldn't completely finish doing the dishes. So to me, doing a quick and dirty job meant getting the most important parts done and the parts that would set you up for an easier time in the future. I haven't been able to verify this, but I have a feeling it might be a regional saying or more popular in the Pacific Northwest where I grew up. For example, most people I encountered in the early years didn't seem familiar with the phrase. But when I visited Seattle in 2008 and was walking on the waterfront, I came across a banner for a quick and dirty boat building contest. You can see the picture on the transcript of this podcast at quickanddirtytips.com. It appeared that people had just a few hours to build a boat out of plywood, and then they saw whose would float the farthest. When I was starting the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network way back in 2006, most podcasts were really long, and I wanted a description that let people know that these were short tips that had the most important information, the stuff you really needed, the stuff you'd find most useful and helpful. Originally, the podcast usually clocked in at less than five minutes, But people said over and over that they wanted more, so eventually I added segments and let some of them be longer. Those are what I call the meaty middles, meaty implying that they're more hearty or complete. And then the tidbits are segments that aren't quite as useful, but they're still interesting. For example, segments that talk about why we use certain phrases, like saying something bad is beyond the pale, or saying someone who's sad is in the doldrums. I call those segments tidbits to distinguish them from the more how-to-oriented quick and dirty tips. So that's it. That's why the network is called the Quick and Dirty Tips Podcast Network, and that's why my short segments are called Quick and Dirty Tips. And now let's have a quick and dirty tip about the word momentarily. The problem is that momentarily is losing its original meaning. Momentarily has its roots in the word momentary, as in the Pink Floyd song A Momentary Lapse of Reason, and it traditionally means for a moment. But it's more common these days to hear people use momentarily when they mean in a moment. The Oxford English Dictionary says this is mainly an American problem. Its first example of momentarily being used to mean in a moment is from a novel written in 1869. I often hear Stickler's joke about flight attendants saying, we'll be on the ground momentarily, as if it means the flight will just touch down and take off again, because momentarily should mean for a moment, not in a moment. But Garner's Modern American Usage says using momentarily to mean in a moment is ubiquitous, even though some stalwarts do still object to it. So what should you do? If you want to be careful, then don't use the word momentarily to mean in a moment. It still annoys some people, but that group of people is also getting smaller. 
Fighting against that use is a lost cause, so when you see it, don't get too upset about it either. Save your energy for battles you can win. Before we get to the meaty middle about clear sentences, thank you to our sponsor this week, Blinkist. Do you have a long list of books you want to read but no time to read them? I know I do. Well, Blinkist is the solution. It's the only app that takes thousands of best-selling nonfiction books and distills them down to their most essential elements, kind of like quick and dirty tips. So you can read or listen to them in less than 15 minutes on your phone. You can learn more in 15 minutes with Blinkist than you can with almost any other method. And their huge library is constantly growing, with timeless classics like Think and Grow Rich and current bestsellers like Madeleine Albright's Fascism, A Warning. Last week, while I was on the treadmill at the gym, I listened to A River in Darkness, which is the harrowing true story of one man's life and eventual escape from North Korea. And it helped the time fly by while I was exercising. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for you. Go to Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, dot com slash grammar to start your free seven-day trial. You'll be glad you did. Blinkist.com slash grammar. And now, on to the merits of keeping your subjects short. Some sentences just sound awkward. In order to ensure clarity, writers need to consider more than just grammar. Weight is equally important. In the following extract from Making Sense, acclaimed linguist David Crystal shows how sentence length and weight affect writing quality. Say the following two sentences out loud. Which of them is more natural and easier to understand? It was nice of John and Mary to come and visit us the other day. Or, for John and Mary to come and visit us the other day was nice. I've tested sentence pairs like this many times and never come across anyone who prefers the second sentence. People say things like, it's awkward and clumsy. Ending the sentence with, was nice, sounds abrupt. Putting all that information at the beginning stops me from getting to the point. And the first one's much clearer. Here's another example. Which of these two sentences sounds more natural? The trouble began suddenly on the 31st of October, 1998. The trouble began on the 31st of October, 1998, suddenly. Again, the first is judged to be the better alternative. The second sentence doesn't break any grammatical rules and could easily turn up in a novel, but few people like it and some teachers would correct it. What both these examples show is the importance of length or weight. The first pair illustrates how English speakers like to place the heavier part of a sentence toward the end rather than at the beginning. The second pair shows a preference for a longer time adverbial to come after a shorter one. Both illustrate the principle of end weight. It was a principle that the prescriptive grammarians recognized too. In his appendix on perspicuity, Lindley Murray states several rules for promoting what he calls the strength of sentences. His fourth rule is, quote, when our sentence consists of two members, the longer should generally be the concluding one, unquote. Children learn this principle early in their third year of life. Susie, for example, knew the phrase red car and around age two started to use it in bigger sentences. But she would say such things as see red car long before she said things like red car gone. In grammatical terms, she expanded her object before she expanded her subject. It'll be that way throughout her life. Adults, too, in their conversational speech keep their subject short and put the bulk of the information after the verb. Three quarters of the clauses we use in everyday conversation begin with just a pronoun or a very short noun phrase. I know what you're thinking. We went to the show by taxi. The rain was coming down in buckets. Only as speech becomes more formal and subject matter more intricate do we encounter longer subjects. All the critical remarks that have been made about his conduct— 
amount to very little. Taking in such a sentence, we feel the extra demand being made on our memory. We have to keep those 11 words in mind, all the critical remarks that have been made about his conduct, before we learn what the speaker or writer is going to do with them. Longer subjects, of course, are common in written English, as in this science report. The products of the decomposition of diaryl peroxides in various solvents have been extensively studied by Smith. A really long subject, especially one containing difficult words or concepts, may make such a demand on our working memory that we have to go back and read the sentence again, as in this tax return instruction from the 1960s. Particulars of the date of sale and sale price of a car used only for the purposes of your office or employment or the date of cessation of use and open market price of that date should be furnished on a separate sheet. This is the kind of sentence up with which the plain English campaign did not put. And indeed, as a result of that campaign, tax returns and other documents for public use have had a serious linguistic makeover in recent years. In speech, if a subject goes on for too long, listener frustration starts to build up, as it's difficult to retain all the information without knowing what's going to be done with it. My supporters in the party, who have been behind me from the very onset of this campaign, and who know very well that the country is also behind me, and on and on and on, we urgently need a verb. It's a problem that can present itself in writing, too, as when we read a slowly scrolling news headline on our television screen that begins like this. The writer and broadcaster John Jones, author of the best-selling series of children's books on elephants and well-known presenter of natural history programs on BBC Two, blah, 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 has won a prize, has died, has joined Real Madrid. Once the scrolling subject went on for so long that I had forgotten the name of the person by the time the sentence came to an end announcing his death. Long subjects can be a problem for children in their early reading. The sooner they get to the verb, the sooner they'll get a sense of what the sentence is about. So a sentence such as this one presents an immediate processing difficulty. A big red jug full of warm milk was on the table. Eight words to hold in mind before we get to the point. The end weight principle suggests it would be easier to read as this. On the table was a big red jug full of warm milk. To summarize, David Crystal advises us to keep our subjects short and to try to place the heavier part of a sentence at the end. Again, that was an excerpt from Making Sense by David Crystal, Honorary Professor of Linguistics at the University of Wales, Bangor. It's included here with permission from the Oxford University Press blog. In addition to Yael, who asked the quick and dirty tips question, thanks also to Fat Elvis 2005, who listens every week and left a great review at Apple Podcasts. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all my old articles and podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com. And you can get them easily and ad-free by signing up for Stitcher Premium. Links to everything are in the show notes. That's all. Thanks for listening. 